Marketing as part of the MOVE United Leadership Conference. My name is Julia Ray and I am the Programs Director with MOVE United, formerly Disabled Sports USA. We'd like to thank the Bob Woodruff Foundation for their long-standing commitment and support, allowing us to bring you this virtual opportunity. For those who missed any of the previous sessions, Recordings and session resources can be found on the conference webpage, which is the same page you use to RSVP for these sessions. Or for those who also need closed captioning, please check out the recorded sessions via Move United's YouTube channel where this feature can be enabled. Before turning the show over to our speakers today, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute to minimize distractions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions rather than the chat function. But feel free to use the chat function to introduce yourselves to each other and make sure you send your message to all panelists and attendees to introduce yourself to the whole group and share resources. So I want to thank our speakers today, Nico, Russ and Juan, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to them for them to introduce the session and themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Russ Meyer. I'm the executive director of Capital Region Nordic Alliance, a uh, Move United chapter uh, based out of Albany, New York. We're a multi-sport or a community multi-sport organization. And what we're going to present on today, uh, both myself and my uh, colleagues, is a sport that is very prevalent, uh, that has universal application and um, it's trail orienteering. And um, so uh, what I'd like to do is have uh, Dr. Latvikoko and Dr. Valente introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll start the presentation. It'll be divided into thirds. Uh, I'll present uh, the first third with some introductory material. Dr. Latvikoko will uh, pick up with um, additional uh, information about the various components of trail orienteering. And then you'll all have the opportunity to try a tempo orienteering with Dr. Valente at the end, who created a very nice trail orienteering event uh, while in quarantine in his house in Spain. So uh, you have a speaker from the United States, Finland, and Spain, very international collaborative effort here. And most certainly we hope you all uh, derive some very interesting perspectives and uh, continued interest in perhaps incorporating this sport into your programming. Uh, Mika? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mika Latvakokko, and uh, currently I'm a physics instructor at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. And I've been doing this job uh, along with this. Phillips Academy is a boarding school, a high school. So uh, I've been an instructor in both cross country skiing and uh, outdoor pursuits. In outdoor pursuits, I've had an opportunity to teach the students orienteering. I'm also a member of the US Trail Orienteering Team. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am a computer science teacher at the Polytechnic University in Madrid. But I guess I'm here by, because of my long-term experience orienteering. I'm uh, almost three, 30 years orienteer. And for the last uh, eight or nine years, I've been also practicing the trail law uh, discipline in orienteering with uh, hundreds of events I've been on, included several world champs and European champions. So I say hello from Spain. I hope everyone is OK. Thank you both very much. Next slide. So the goals and objectives of this, uh, of my third and of the presentation, is to introduce you to the basics of trail orienteering. It's a sport, as I say, for literally everyone that can be together on equal footing in pretty much any location. Um, where we will define the sport for you. We're going to talk about foot orienteering, uh, trail orienteering, various components of the sport, uh, fundamentals of the two components within trail orienteering, which are precision and tempo. And as I say at the end, uh, you'll have a uh, real life virtual tempo experience with one. Uh, before we start, just wanna, I'm gonna take a quick poll here of how many of you have either heard of orienteering or actively participating in the sport of orienteering. 
Uh, Ms. Julie Ray is, is putting up a, a poll question there. So if you could uh, answer that for us briefly, that'll help us gauge the percentage. And obviously, if you do find this to be interesting, intriguing, compatible with your programming or a nice addition, uh, we most certainly can continue the conversation. All right, we've had about 75% of our attendees vote. Um, so any remaining, let us know, are you currently involved with an orienteering program? Now I'm going to end that poll. Okay. And I'm sharing the results, showing, um, hopefully you can see that, Russ. I can. Great. So it's going to be wonderful introducing so many uh, to this wonderful sport. So uh, hopefully by the end of this and other continued involvement, those two colors will be reversed. Next slide. So orienteering in itself, and uh, let's see, I'll try to move things down here, yep. Orienteering as a general sport is a group that requires navigational skills using a map and a compass to navigate from point to point in diverse and usually unfamiliar terrain while moving at speed Participants are given a topographical map and usually a specially prepared orienteering map, which they use to find certain points. So uh, as the, as the uh, bullet underneath it shows, it's a road rally and scavenger hunt all in one. And the only real equipment that a person would bring uh, to the event or have the event pro uh, provide to them is just a simple compass. Uh, this is a $10 compass. This is a little bit more, but they help you navigate to find the control points. And we will have orienteering maps for you, but this is a very simple orienteering map that you'll see and is a resource on our website that will help you navigate. So the orienteering is critical thinking, decision-making, problem solving, all are at a premium and really brought to the surface here. Uh, when we do a lot of our camps and clinics, there are athletes, veterans, adults, and youth with disabilities or special needs that before you're done talking to them, they're off and they're going. Uh, for those that aren't particularly into the exercise mode, this type of mental, critical decision-making and accuracy determination in trail orienteering is absolutely ideal. There are many different formats that we'll cover. Uh, again, they can be done anywhere, inside, outside, uh, next. And orienteering has foot orienteering, ski, mountain bike, trail, and for those that are disabilities as well as the able-bodied, and it can be uh, manufactured in individual or teams. So with our clients, we, uh, we run both formats. Next. So this was our Trello team. And again, when we say the term that it is for everyone on equal parity, uh, this team is very interesting in that the gentleman on the far left, Daniel Heimgartner from Virginia, uh, has an undiagnosable neurologic condition. Uh, but even though he has the impairment with mobility, uh, he participates in the team. We have two veterans that are amputees. And of course, there's Mika, uh, Sharon Crawford, and Mike Polson the able-bodied. So the interesting thing about this sport is that those with a variety of impairments and disabilities and those that are the able-bodied compete equally in both formats. Next slide. So Trello involves precise reading of an orienteering map in the corresponding terrain. The orienteers must identify in the terrain and in the presence of decoys, control points shown on the map. Trello involves navigation skills, but unlike regular foot orienteering where you're going through the woods and an expanse of terrain, in trail orienteering, everyone stays on a trail. You have to be relegated to the trail only. And next year when we are in uh, Colorado Springs, Mika and I are working on a map at Quail Lake Park, which is a mile from the headquarters, and we'll have the real event for you. So for those of you that are planning on attending next year, uh, we are going to actually run a real trail event. So there's no point to point. It's conducted on trails and because the objective is accuracy, not the speed, the sport is accessible to physically disabled competitors on equal terms with the able-bodied. 
And last year, a young boy who came to one of our events with a New England Patriots jersey on uh, made the comment, uh, if Tom Brady would have any advantage or have any uh, able to pull off any miracles in the sport, and my reply was, no, uh, everybody is truly on parity in the sport. So, uh, sorry about that if anybody is a uh, New England Patriot fan. Sorry, Mika. Uh, <laughs> precision orienteering is the one format where you have multiple stations and there's one answer per station. And what we're looking for in this is an orienteering control. This is the flag that you can have anywhere from one to five flags at a station. And through accuracy and reading the map with a compass, you are trying to figure out what uh, is the designated control. And you'll see that when Juan does the tempo. The tempo is fewer stations. You have five questions at each station and that is timed. So again, different ways of getting at intellectual discernment, critical thinking, problem solving. One takes your time, is really precision. And the other one, you're under the gun of answering questions in a time component. Next slide. So the basics of trail map orienteering. Next. So we're gonna go over the parts of a trail orienteering map. Now, regarding the map, there are many clubs in the United States and Capital Region Nordic Alliance with Mika and others uh, make uh, and can work with you on making the type of map. And we'll show you different levels of maps in just a few minutes. But uh, the, the fundamentals of a map that are pretty straightforward is that Everybody starts at a triangle and you finish at a circle. The control sites have a circle with a number so you know where you're at. And the description uh, in the map reading, which is wonderful for people at any ability, any level, you have features, symbols, and phrases. And that's all, con that's all contained in a control description box that Mika will review. You have a legend or a key that tells you uh, what types of areas are on the map. There's a scale. The scale tells you whether it's very detailed, very small, or very expansive. For trail orienteering, the scale is usually one to 4,000, one to 5,000, because you're in a small confined area with stations. The contour interval tells you how steep, how changes in elevation there are. And finally, magnetic north lines. Magnetic north lines are something that you use with your compass to keep the map always facing north so you'll be in the right position regardless of what station you're at. Next slide. So this is, um, this is a, a basic map, that an orienteering map that we have used and, and Mika's gonna pick up and, and talk about some other things on this map in his portion but we work with those with intellectual development disabilities, and then we work with veterans that are very in tune with land navigation and orienteering. So as you can see, what we just went over is the legend is on the left. It tells you the different colors, different permanent features that are found on the map. You have the scale, which is one to 1,000. The control description box can use symbols, or for this population, we simply use words. So if you look in the upper right, it's Maple Ridge course clockwise. 0.4 kilometers, you have the control number and a description of where that control's at. So this is a clockwise point to point, it's circle, it goes around the, the boundaries. And what we usually have the clients do is take the lead, read the map, and with the support of the compass and staff or parents or siblings, complete the, complete the map and find all the uh, controls and we try to have them understand and appreciate the surrounding environment as much as, as much as they can, which adds to the value and the appreciation of the event. So with that, I'd like to turn uh, the next portion over to Mika. So I'm uh, right now uh, sharing my screen uh, and um, uh, what I have here on my screen uh, are two maps. They are actually both of them from the U.S. Uh, Trail Orienteering Championships from last year, and these are the solution maps from there. But basically, I, what I want to start with is, as Russ explained, orienteering can be done on foot, on a mountain bike, 
uh, on skis, in a canoe, uh, and today we'll look even uh, more uh, detailed on, on um, uh, you can do it on trails so that uh, people uh, that have mobility restrictions can, can fully join. Uh, uh, because there are so many different types of orienteering, I, I wanted to share to you what, what is common between these, uh, and, and I would say that in my opinion it's two things. It is the map, which is here, and the uh, uh, control flag, which I show over here, and I showed an example of that as well. So in a foot event or a mountain bike event, uh, you would be going from one of these uh, control flags, uh, control sites to another. In a trail event, you try to figure out which of these flags might be or is in the right location. And you're going to use the map to find the flags. So I'm going to go back to the Maple Ridge map that, that Russ had shown to you, and I'm going to walk us through a, uh, a foot orienteering course. So let's say that you are standing outside a building on the uh, west side of the building. Uh, you see on, on, on your left-hand side a parking lot, and next to the parking lot a little green uh, grassy area with multiple different sized trees and shrubs and a flagpole uh, and uh, potentially some kind of exercise equipment as well. On your uh, right, you see a uh, sidewalk and uh, that, that follows the edge of the building, and, and you see three trees, and the first control is on the furthermost of these trees, so you go there and you punch. And you continue around the building on this sidewalk, following the edge of the, uh, the uh, parking lot, you get to the corner of, of, of a sidewalk, and that's where your next control is going to be. Then for control three, you, three, you uh, look across the field, and you probably see the flag at that point uh, across the field. It's at the edge of this little wooded area, but it, you may not see the little knoll it is on because uh, the uh, vegetation is kind of thick there. And uh, you can see that by looking at the color over here, it's, it's, it's green color, but you'd probably see the flag. So you'd head out across the field to control three and punch there. And you would follow the edge of the uh, woods uh, on the uh, uh, field uh, to control four, where we would turn around, look around, and you would see a bench on the grassy area. You would follow uh, the grassy area to the bench, and you would punch there at control five. Then you would know that control six is going to be at the corner of a fence, uh, but you might not see the corner of the fence because there is a wooded area between you and the fence. So you would go around that wooded area and then you would see the fence and the flag and you would punch there. And at this point, you probably would have a lot of confidence already at yourself uh, and you would keep on going. You'd follow the fence, you would follow the building and uh, control seven would be at the corner of the, of, of the building. And then you would uh, follow the uh, side of the building and turn around and you would see your last control, control eight, and then you're back to where you started from and uh, uh, you've just completed your first uh, orienteering course. So this is the basic process by which you navigate uh, and uh, figure out uh, uh, how, how, how to move uh, on the map. Uh, and, and you basically read the map and I'm showing you here uh, some uh, of the uh, orienteering symbols that you will be seeing on, on an, any orienteering map, be it a trail orienteering map, foot orienteering map, ski orienteering map, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the symbols are uh, basically colored. Um, so you can see, for example, blue color indicates water or water features. Yellow in orienteering map typically means open area. Uh, different levels of open area, either it's grassy area or it's, it's a, a little bit wilder, but still open and you can see a long distance. Uh, white typically means just regular woods. Green means thicker woods or thicker vegetation or sometimes distinct vegetation. Brown and black are reserved for, uh, brown for specifically for landforms and black specifically for rock features. They're also used for man-made features. So for example, black features um, and, uh, would be on, the, on a map would be buildings uh, and, and things like this man-made. And uh, brown man-made features typically are, are open areas uh, like uh, uh, parking lots or uh, sandy fields or something like that. So 
Uh, as you move around the orienteering course, we need a language to describe where these control flags are located. And that is done by this control feature description. So for every a landform or every uh, rock feature or water feature or vegetation feature, there's a distinct symbol that is used and, uh, and uh, you will be able to tell by looking at that symbol and looking at the map of the circle on the map, you will be able to tell what that feature is. Um, in addition, there's further information about the, uh, the, uh, the, the symbols in the, on the map, the, uh, on, the con on the symbolic control descriptions, which you will see on the next slide uh, in, a, in a real map. Uh, you will see the control number. So what, what number control is it on your course? In trail orienteering, you would see uh, Alpha or Alpha through Bravo or Alpha through Charlie or uh, so on, Alpha through Echo, which is telling you how many flags there are. Then uh, next uh, side would tell you which one of similar features uh, in that circle it might be. Uh, the next one tells you what feature it is. Next one tells you uh, what, uh, what is its appearance. Uh, next one tells you its size. And then last uh, two uh, uh, sections tell you what side of the feature it is located in. And in last, the age, the other information in trail orienteering that is used to tell you which side you are viewing the flags. So sometimes it would be possible for you to be on the east side or west side of the flag. So it will tell you which side you are viewing them from. So uh, next I'm showing you uh, uh, about how you navigate the trail orienteering map. Uh, the map is always uh, set to uh, north with uh, uh, magnetic north lines. So uh, you don't have to take magnetic declination ever on an orienteering map. It is always oriented to magnetic north at, at that time. So you can use your compass to figure out which way is north. Uh, on the map, uh, you will see, as Russ explained, control circles, and they match uh, control description boxes, uh, uh, which I just described. You would read the control description, and you would read the center of the circle, and you would figure out what are you looking for. Uh, then you uh, look for uh, station features. Uh, and permanent features to figure out where you are uh, uh, in relation to what you're looking for. And then finally, you decide uh, which, uh, which is the correct flag for you. So this is a uh, trail orienteering course that uh, I designed uh, last year in uh, Washington Park in Albany, New York. This was used by uh, um, veterans in uh, uh, Albany, New York uh, by CRN CRNA. And uh, on this course, you can see that the starting triangle is at the north end of this uh, pond on the Washington Park. And since it is a trail orienteering course, you're only allowed to stay on the paved paths, which are here marked with the brown color uh, uh, path. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, from the start to the first control, you would be uh, looking for a, uh, a bend in a path if you look carefully at the center of the circle, you'll notice that it is not the path uh, that is paved, but it is a, a smaller path that is going right next to the uh, lake. And when you get there, uh, you will see three flags because of the fact that this shows uh, Alpha through Charlie as, as your options uh, for the flag. The last line is telling you that you will be looking for it from the uh, east side, so you will be facing west in order to find uh, which one is the correct flag. So you would see three flags, and they would be from left to right named Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. And then you would decide which, if any of these flags, is in the correct location. Are any of them on the trail? Are any of them on the right bend on the trail? And uh, if, if, they, if any of them is in the right location, you would choose that flag. Then control two is alpha through echo. Uh, it says that then that there must be five flags that are visible from the decision point. By the way, the decision points are not marked on the map. 
So you will have to know where you are uh, when you uh, uh, make the decision on, on, on which flag is the right, right one. Uh, only the uh, control circles on, on where the flags are are marked. So um, in this particular case, you would be looking for the northwestern in between, between two trees. And most likely in a situation like this, you, because there are many trees uh, around there, uh, you would have probably uh, uh, flags in all kinds of in-betweens between the trees. You just have to figure out which one is the correct one. Controls three and four are landforms. So uh, in this case, they are both re-entrants, which are little indents on the side of a hill. And uh, what you would do in uh, control three, you would be again be looking for three flags, same as control four. You would be looking for in three, basically uh, a, a flag that is fairly far into this indent, into this re-entrant, almost all the way to the uh, uh, stone wall that you see on the background. Whereas control four, it would be much, much closer to you and much, much lower down in this uh, indent or reentrant uh, because it's uh, uh, on the first contour line, not the second one uh, of the same reentrant. Okay, so you would then go, go your uh, way through this course. You would solve problems five, six. Uh, uh, six would be already at a playground. Uh, seven and eight and nine uh, are actually sharing uh, flags, so that's possible too. So for example, uh, in, in seven, eight, and nine, you would see five flags, and of those five flags, one might be the answer for seven, one might be the answer for eight, and, and, and one might be the answer for nine. And uh, eight, seven would be on the south side of a tree, Eight would be on the south side of a, a little canopy or building that you can go through. And uh, nine would be, again, in this re-entrant. You'll notice that controls 11 and 12 are alpha controls. That means that there is only one flag there. So the question then is, is that flag in the right location or not? Sometimes it isn't, and uh, you answer zero. And sometimes it is in the right location, in which case you would answer alpha. In all, all of these cases, oftentimes there is an opportunity for, a, for example, the fourth control, Alpha True Charlie, could also be zero, uh, none of the flags above. Uh, but uh, uh, for beginners, we often don't make them uh, uh, have the zero option except in the Alpha questions. So once you are finished, uh, uh, you will uh, go to the uh, double circle, and that's where you finish your course. Now, I'm going to show next what a time control or a tempo control would, would look like. And by the way, let's look over here uh, more carefully. You'll notice that this area over here is the field to which this uh, uh, tempo control or time control uh, will be referring to. So when you get to a time control or a tempo control, you don't have a map. And in theory, you don't see any of the flags. They are blocked from your view. So when you sit down, it is the first time you see the flags. And in, in Tempo, there are typically six flags. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and Foxtrot, all the way uh, from left to right. And then you are given a map. For example, here the first map would be find a reentrant located at this location. Uh, so what you would probably use to uh, figure out where you are is the flag called the little T, the, a blue cross, which is a water fountain, and the green circle, which is a tree. Uh, you would be looking for a reentrant next to a spur on uh, next to the tree, uh, and uh, you would uh, try to figure out where you are related to it, and then you would answer the question. Then you would turn over the next problem, and in the next problem, uh, you will again be looking for a reentrant, but a different reentrant. This would be the reentrant between the flagpole and the tree, and it would be oriented differently as well. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that the map is always in tempo oriented in the direction that you are facing, so you know that uh, that much on it. And sometimes it is helpful to figure out where you are on the map right away so that then you can use features that you already recognized for the next problem. Uh, so in this case, you would be looking for a reentrant between the flagpole and the tree, and uh, not as high up as the flagpole is, 
uh, but probably as far away from the road as the flagpole was. So here's examples of uh, these, uh, these uh, terrain features or so landforms. Uh, um, this shows uh, three landforms, a terrace, a spur, and a re-entrant. Uh, terrace is a large spur, a spur is a, a, a little uh, a outward extension on the hillside, whereas re-entrant is an inward indentation on the on a hillside. Uh, the control descriptions can and describe what part of the feature it is as well. So in this case, there are there's terrace for the west part, the, uh, spur and, and re-entrant for the upper part. And then they can describe uh, what type it is. So for example, the last example gives you uh, a shallow uh, re-entrant. So you will use your map, your control description, your compass, and your wits to figure out uh, which one of these flags is in the correct location. And then uh, it's time now for me to uh, give the controls to Juan. Uh, about. So hello again. I'm going to, to share my screen. So I'm going to talk about the, the, te the tempo discipline. There are two disciplines on the trailer. One is a pre-O or precision orienting. The last map that Nika showed is about precision orienting. And I am going to talk about uh, tempo orienting. Tempo is, the, um, is a discipline where the, an event is composed of uh, several stations and each station has uh, a few tasks. Typically, an event could count with uh, five to seven stations and maybe four to five tasks per, per station. Uh, the main difference with the precision orienting, the other discipline, is the, 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 the time impact. In precision orienting, uh, the, the what counts mo the most is how many uh, controls you have uh, right. In tempo, there is a, a bit more of time pressure. So it's not just uh, how many uh, you answer correctly, but also the time you have taken to, to do the, uh, the answers. This is the 100% inclusive uh, discipline of orienteering because even in the precision orienteering, Mm, people with uh, uh, best physical abilities can have a small advantage. You, you could see on the map that Nika showed that maybe uh, the flags from one control are very far apart. Maybe you want to look them from different places. Maybe, maybe you want to run 100 meters uh, back and forth to see the, the flags better, to see exactly where they are. So uh, people with uh, some physical impairment maybe can do this back and forth a fewer times, so maybe it's a small disadvantage. But in tempo, everybody is equal. We all have to be seated in one place, and there the maps are given to us, and we have to answer the different tasks of the station without moving. We can move our neck, but that's all the movement we can do. So gangs, uh, different sexes, uh, different impairment abilities, uh, makes uh, little to none difference and uh, everybody is on the same term. In fact, there is not, in big events, there is not even the Paralympic um, uh, category. Everybody is ranked on the same classification. You can see here a uh, tempo station. This is uh, from World Championships uh, three years, four years ago. It's a spectator station. You can see there one of the marshals showing a smiley face. That is that uh, the answer, answer by the competitor was correct. So we can share up. The spectators can uh, can can know if the the competitor is uh, going well or not so well in their answers and make uh, some nice uh, atmosphere with the sharing up and, and so on. 
I'm going to show you also a video from one of the world champions, so one of the last world championships, so you can see the atmosphere of the of these type of events. You can see also the different uh, uh, kinds of persons that uh, go in these events, young, old, uh, males, females, with different in impairments, so on, very different uh, uh, very diversity in the participants. Uh, also, um, no, let me show you the, the, the video. I hope it goes well. And I hope you can see. <music> Sorry for this. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, it seems that my Wi-Fi Wi-Fi is not uh, able to show the video. So pity, but let's go on. So the next thing I would like to, to show you was the was the my event that uh, Ross uh, talked to you about you earlier. So uh, we are in the COVID era. In Spain, we have the very strict confinement rules. We, for almost two months, gladly it's uh, over the, this hard part, but from almost two months, we could not leave uh, our homes, not just for go to the supermarket and a little, little more if we are not uh, physicians or nurses or uh, policemen. So, almost two months without uh, being able to, to leave our homes. So the Trello community became very active promoting uh, online events. It was very nice because it gave us something to, to pass our time. And I decided to do the same. Uh, as I could not uh, leave my home, I created an event which I called uh, From My Window because it was literally that, uh, what I can see from my window. Uh, luckily, I had the map done from several years ago where, where I made the map to, to do some uh, activities for my children. So it's a very small but uh, enough for creating this uh, event. And just by using the, this map, this small map of my condominium, uh, my phone camera and Google Forms, I developed this event. We had more than 1,100 inscriptions. We made a mass start in order to be able to, let's say, people could share the, couldn't share the, the answers. So we had a mass start on the April 25 with more than 700 people. And uh, since there, the, the, the form is open. So a few hundred more have done the, this event uh, since then going to show you now how it looked like. It's just a, a Google form. It gives you some information, some of the information that Mika and Raz have told you about. And then you have to uh, fill in some information, basic, basically so I can answer you with the answers and so on. And then you click next. It's just a caption in order to get you started. And there, there we go. This would be the, the first station. Each uh, station here would be like sharing the same photo, the same terrain in real world. And we also have a map. I'm going to make it a bit larger so we can all see better, even if 
doesn't fit the screen. So you can see here the map with the control circle. We have to find if there is a flag, one of these flags on the, on the exact middle center of the circle. So one of the key things we have to know about trail orienting is that the flags we can we see, we are going to name them from left to right independently if they are far away or close to us. We just have to look left to right. The leftmost would be the A flag. Second one would be B, C, D, E, and F flag. The second part is the, the map. So we have the um, some key elements on, on the map. We have to focus. The yellow on the orienting maps is uh, absence of vegetation, absence of uh, woods. So in this case, the yellow would refer to the grass. All this would be yellow on the map. The brown, the light brown would be paved areas. So you can see here, this paved area, this one back here. Also, we can see the stairs. These would be the stairs. So it's quite obvious, uh, quite intuitive uh, to have, even if you don't know the, the exact symbols, you can make a, a pretty good guess right now. I'm going to pass this one quickly, just any answer, and maybe give you time to, to answer this one. Uh, you can see there that the, the map, the circle, the center of the circle is exactly on the corner of the paved area. The exact corner is done by this uh, small indication. And so we have to see and run answer which one of the flags are on the right uh, position. So I guess most of you have already decided that this flag is on the exact position that the, the center of the circle uh, is asking me. So I would answer, as it is the leftmost flag, I would answer A, and that would be a correct uh, answer for me. So we can go on doing a bit more uh, tasks on this station. I'm going to go quickly as time is going, as passing by very quickly. I want to show you another station. This is the last task of this first station. So we go on to the second station. There you can see another station means another terrain, another set of uh, flags, but the same concept from left to right. Here as the visual distortion of the photography maybe could, could bring some doubts. I named here E and F so everybody could be sure which one was the right answer. And you can see here this set of stairs with a small band at the end correspond to this set of stairs. So people would begin quickly to locate. And in order to answer to this uh, task, which is on the uh, on a vegetation on the east east side west side, sorry, of the vegetation, that would be to this side as north is not uh, directed to the top of the photo. So it would be on the next set of stairs, the vegetation next to it. It has a flag, but as you can see, it's not uh, in the vegetation close to the second stairs, but rather a bit further away. So a bit further away, there is no flag. So I would have to answer that there is no flag on the right spot. So I would answer Z. And in this case, I would have another correct answer. So this is the dynamics of the tempo event. Uh, keep doing like this with, if it is in a competitive uh, event, uh, you have to bear in mind that uh, 
time is uh, always ticking and the penalty for a wrong answer is 30 seconds. So at the end, if you take more than 30 seconds to answer one task, you, um, it doesn't matter if, do it, if you do it uh, right or wrong, you have to do it quickly to, in order to be competitive. So that's the pressure. Even an easy, an easy tempo event like would be this one could be very stressful and very demanding because of the time pressure. So I would leave you just to, to finish. I would uh, take you back to my uh, presentation just to show you, I pretty much believe that this will be available, uh, the link to the event in case any of you would like to, to test it. So this will be the link. I'm pretty sure that the Movie United crew would put it for you, but if you want to take a photo, that uh, that is the link to to take part on the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, before we've we've actually just ripped through the time here and just fascinating tools and, and especially love the the online options. But we're getting quite a lot of questions, and I do want to make sure we just address one key question before we have to leave today. Um, and I'm not sure which of you could speak to this, but solutions for um, our visually impaired athletes um, in regards to orienteering. Would you care to speak about that a little bit? Uh, what CRNA is embarking on, for those that are visually impaired and blind, is a collaborative agreement with Microsoft Soundscapes and uh, a number of major uh, social service agencies in the military advisor program uh, to pilot specific trail orienteering events for those that are visually impaired and blind. Uh, we are working on it as we speak and we look to have pilots in this region and perhaps throughout the country uh, incorporating those that have visual impairments or blindness uh, into Trello. Uh, so we look forward to having that up within three to five months. Um, and so uh, I think my contact information uh, is, is included in all the um, resources on the website. Uh, so those people that are looking at including those with visual impairments, uh, Microsoft, ourselves, and uh, International Orienteering Federation are committed to uh, having them be uh, included uh, fully uh, within the next six months. Thank you very much. And we're getting a lot of um, technical questions that I think what we're going to do is uh, share those with our speakers so that they may answer you individually post event. Um, but really want to thank the three of you for sharing this information about this fascinating sport today. Um, we'd now like to encourage everyone at the end of the session to complete the survey, which will pop up at your screen. Um, tell us what you think about what you've heard today. And then also join us over on on Instagram, search for us um, at Move United Sport um, and join our 15 minute movement session with a couple of Move United staff members, Ryan and Carolyn. They'll be leading you on a virtual hike. I don't know if it's going to include any orienteering, but I think there'll be a dog or two. Um, so please join us if you can over on Instagram momentarily. But thanks to both of you um, and everybody who's, who's joined us here today. We'll see you in the next session this afternoon. Well, thank you so much for uh, letting us provide the uh, support to uh, the attendees. Thank you.